Hi class, this is Bill Berry with an introduction to our JavaScript class. This is IT 102 Intro to Programming and uh, this video will contain mostly the Intro to Programming in JavaScript part. The class orientation will actually do in person so I will skip that part and we'll just jump down into an introduction to programming and then we'll learn a little bit more about JavaScript as we go here. Let's find the slide that we want. There we go. Okay, so uh, what we're going to learn today here is a couple of interesting topics. We're going to look back a little bit about programming, how programming evolved over the years so that we understand the context in which we're working, which is JavaScript. How did we get here? Uh, we'll learn a little bit more about JavaScript. We'll talk about basic functions and methods. We'll learn how to ask the user questions. Like there's a lot of interesting stuff coming up over the various videos. Now, this is going to be broken up into a couple of videos because I don't want them to get too long so we'll start and do them piece by piece and you may have several videos that all go with the same content so don't worry about that. First thing is how did programming get to be where it is today? Where did we start? Where did we, you know, how did we evolve? Let's look at that real briefly. First is Programming is the idea that you can give instructions to a computer to make it do tasks that you want to do. So programming is the way that we do that. We tell the computer what we want done, how to accomplish the tasks, and it will then carry out our instructions. This is definitely a field that has changed uh, dramatically since its inception, and we'll look at that briefly here. Understand that it is also complex and error prone. To write very complicated programs, if we're talking on the order of something like Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel, they are a hugely uh, complex engineering feats. And they are also very error prone. Even small scripts, as we see, can generate errors. So it takes us a little bit of patience and a little bit of logic to figure out how to uh, fix all these bugs and to create something that actually works as we intend. But it's also a little puzzle. So if your brain likes puzzles and you can think logically and in detailed steps, you'll be able to do programs, write small programs, and have them work successfully. So that's great. Let's look briefly at how languages have come along through the years. First thing is, uh, before we even got to this point, Early, early computers, as, as we know, all computers speak in ones and zeros, but early computers had very little way for us to communicate that. So if we really got some pictures of the earliest computers, they really dealt with switches and lights. So if you wanted to tell the computer something, you would set a series of switches, and those switches would represent, for instance, if they were in the up position, it would be a one, and if it was in the down position, it would be a zero, ones and zeros, on and off. And then the program would run and then the way that you would see your output is that you would see a series of lights and those lights would indicate on being one and off being zero. So once again ones and zeros that's the way we communicated. Now that's a pretty lousy way to communicate and do programs so programming languages started evolving as we went here. One of the first evolutions is called machine language. And while it is still very hard to read, as you'll see over here at the right, uh, let me get me a little laser pointer so I can point at things the way I want. Uh, so as you see over here, this stuff is not very easy to read. Uh, it is not very symbolic, uh, but it is a way for us to communicate these ones and zeros at least via some sort of communication system that doesn't involve switches. So we were able to write programs in machine language and it would translate these uh, as you will learn later this is hexadecimal type of uh, instructions but it will translate these instructions into something that the machine can run and then it can show them again uh, you know maybe in earlier early versions maybe there were some sorts of displays that it could show the output in a similar fashion uh, so basically you know this was an evolution but it wasn't a very great evolution because it's still very hard and you still have to figure out what the heck does 4F mean? Uh, and maybe it means to add something, or maybe it means a specific number. So really not a very uh, great way to talk to a computer, but it was, it was an evolution. The next step is a big jump forward, 
and that is assembly language. And assembly language is very closely related to the machine's language. Each machine has its own specific language that it speaks. For instance, the Intel processors that we use today have a specific set of ones and zeros that they understand, uh, and each, each major computer platform has its own as well. But with assembly language, at least you could start writing some things that were a little more mnemonic or symbolic. For instance, when we see the word here, add, we know that that's adding two things together. It's adding some things and uh, and making use of the results somewhere. Uh, you can also, let's see, CMP, you can compare. So this was comparing the thing in register CX and then it is going and finding some information and doing a comparison. So it's a little more symbolic, at least we have some idea what the heck is going on here. And uh, that's assembly language, again, very closely related to the CPU's instruction language, but at least uh, getting a little more human readable still not what we'd like, so let's keep marching forward in time. Next, we started getting high-level programming languages, and these languages uh, let us express things in a very human-readable way, or a more human-readable way, with actual words that we would understand. So this is an early uh, language called Fortran, and a Fortran program might look like this. I want to print something. I want to print the question A a question mark. I want to read something from <clears throat> perhaps the keyboard or perhaps a card or perhaps wherever it came from and then we can we can sort of read this if the thing called NA is less than or equal to zero then then print the thing and then stop. So even though this isn't maybe completely easy for our brains, at least we're getting to the point where we can read the thing and get some ideas of what's happening. We're printing, we're reading something from input, we're doing some checks to see if things are less than or equal to, we're printing answers, we're stopping, etc. So high-level languages are starting to get much more English-like, and they are easier for our brains, which also means they are accessible to more humans. It doesn't have to be quite such a specialized field of humans that are able to read and write this stuff. How about next steps? Let's look at that. Now we're looking at modern high-level languages and they have gotten even easier than this. They are much more human readable and let's look at an example from Python for instance. Here we have we're going to input something from the user so we're going to input it. We're turning it into a floating point number and we're storing it in a thing called subtotal. Later, we're calculating the tax by taking the subtotal and multiplying it by 0 0.10. We're calculating the total by taking the subtotal and adding the tax. And then we're printing some output, including the total. This is much easier to read. This, we have a chance of actually wrapping our brains around. And this is the kind of language that makes it accessible for us to learn programming. So this is where we are today with languages like this that let us uh, talk to the computer in a way that seems a little more accessible and we, uh, we can certainly make a go of it these days. So the next big question that we have with this is what happens, uh, how do we actually get these things into the computer and have them run? How does this work? Because we know the computer speaks ones and zeros, but we want to read and write in high level languages. So how does that work? You got to get from one step to another. So let's talk about some different ways that you might be able to do that. I'll make two level ana two analogies for you to, to help you understand, but the, the basic uh, idea of the analogy is, let's say that I've written a paper in English and I want to present it at a conference in Spain. Now my Spanish is decent, my pronunciation is pretty good, but certainly if I'm writing a computer high-level collegiate type paper, uh, I'm not quite up to that task of getting a super great collegiate Spanish paper. So I need something to help me translate to get from my English paper into this great paper in Spanish that I can share with colleagues there. How are that those kinds of things are going to happen. What are some different ways that I can make that work? Well, let's look at two possibilities. Uh, the first possibility is I could have someone translate the paper. I could just hire somebody and they could take the whole paper, they would go away, work on it, and they would translate it into very professional level Spanish. 
that's great. Then I have a paper in Spanish. I can pass it out at the conference uh, and they can simply read it very quickly in their native language. So that would be an easy way to, to make it happen. Another approach, though, would be that I could hire a real-time translator, maybe somebody actually there. So I could go to Spain and I would read one line of my paper and they would translate it into Spanish. This is like the simultaneous translation that you hear at the UN. It happens almost in real time. There's a little bit of uh, hesitation because you have to listen and hear and translate. Uh, but this is another way that I could do this. Well, we have a very similar thing that can happen in taking programming languages languages and turning them into uh, machine code that the machine can run. What are those two approaches? The first is called compiling. And what a compiler does is much like the translation of the whole speech. It gobbles up the entire program and it spits out machine language. Right? So, for instance, it could take a whole C program and it could produce something that could run directly on the machine. For instance, the Microsoft C compiler produces executable files. So the file extensions are going to be things like EXE and DLL, things that you know and have seen on your computer that represent programs. Now, this is very platform specific. So my Microsoft C compiler might be uh, producing an executable that can run on a Windows Intel machine. It's specific to that platform. It can't necessarily run on every computer across the world, but the computers that have Intel type chips and Microsoft Windows, they're going to be great. So why is this good? Why is this compiling a good thing? Well, execution speed is great because once we get this executable file out, it's going to execute very quickly because the machine already has it in its native language. So to load up and run an executable file, super, super fast. Often those also give you more control over the hardware. Since they target very specific hardware, you can be specific about the kinds of things that you do. Now, what kind of pitfalls are there? What's the downside? Well, compiling can take a very long time. If you think about a program like Microsoft Word that's got millions of lines of code, that's going to take hours to compile. So this can be a big thing. Uh, if something happens during that compile process, uh, then you might have to start all over and you got hours more to go ahead of you. Also, they are platform specific, so they are not independent. If you want to run that on another kind of platform, you've got to go find a different kind of compiler. So examples of that, C, C++, and there's some other examples here of compiled languages. So that's a common way that things happen in the way to get from high-level languages to a machine. But there's another way. Let's look at our analogy for interpreted languages. Remember the analogy there was a real-time translator. So what does a program that, uh, what kind of uh, programming language interpreter, what does that do? Well, it reads one instruction at a time. Then it turns that instruction into machine language and it runs it. And then it reads the next instruction and turns it into machine language and it runs it. So that's great. It happens at runtime, right? It actually does this translation one step at a time. Now, the other interesting thing is you've got to have that interpreter with you, right? If I'm at the, at the conference in Spain, I've got to carry around my interpreter all the time if I want to talk about uh, that, if I want to give parts of that speech, right? I'm not going to go ad lib it. Uh, I, I'm going to need that interpreter with me, so that's got to be present. So, for instance, if you are writing programs in Python, you must have the Python interpreter on your machine. You must go download it. So if you write a Python script and you want to go show it to a friend, you're going to have to have them install Python on their computer in order to run it. That's the downside of having an interpreted language. The good news is it's more platform independent, right? You can run it on whatever machine has a Python interpreter. Uh, I'll, but the, the downside is it's going to be a little bit slower. It doesn't have this, uh, you know, I can load it and run it directly on the machine kind of feel. It's going to have to run step by step on that machine every single time. So it's going to be a little bit slower and it's also going to need that environment on the machine. So what kinds of modern languages are interpreted? Well, as mentioned before, Python is one of them and you'll notice JavaScript is another one of those interpreted languages. So what does that mean? That means you need the JavaScript interpreter on your machine. 
Well, turns out that's not such a hard thing because web browsers, modern web browsers, all have the ability to run JavaScript and interpret it. So you already have a JavaScript interpreter on your machine, you just didn't know it. It's in your browser. So if you have Firefox, you have Chrome, you have Internet Explorer, you have Edge, whatever it is, you've got JavaScript, you can run it directly on your machine and it's going to be okay. There is one other odd sort of uh, version of this in the world. Some languages don't do either of the two exactly so neatly, and Java is an example of that, so you can read this over and understand a little more about it if you'd like. And uh, it, is, it is another way to get a little more platform independent. It's sort of halfway in between in some ways. And so read that over if you like, and you can look up background. But Java is a very common uh, example of this bytecode language that sort of straddles the compiled interpreter kind of language. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to jump in and actually write some JavaScript. So we'll be getting into that in the next video. So uh, continue on there and let me know if you have any questions in the meantime. Thanks for watching.